So welcome everybody. Thank, thank you again to take time. I know um, some of us resume uh, our clinical work. Some of us went back to, to seeing patients. So uh, I know for some of us, it's going to be difficult to be live with, as usual with us. So uh, welcome everybody that is live with us and welcome everybody that is listening to the recording also. So today, very um, fascinating subject, one of my favorite webinar about anterior knee pain. Uh, it's so interesting because one way or the other, as a professional, whether we're surgeons or physical therapists, we know that anterior knee pain has some kind of biomechanical involvement. There's some movement issues involved. And one way or the other, we have all of our different approach, right? right? Classically, we are going to look at when our patient's going to do a squat or when he's going to step down. Does he perform a, a, a good movement? Is he well stabilized? Does he collapse into valgus? So this is really a, a pathology where we know that there is some pathomechanics, right? There's a, some wrong movement involved in anterior knee pain. So having a deeper dive into what do we want to focus on? What it, does the literature teaches us? and how important it is for that specific pathology with, this specific pa with these specific patients to go into a proper rehabilitation of the movement. So it's really one of my favorite webinars and I'll, we all hope that you're gonna enjoy it also. And uh, please, uh, uh, Joe, take, uh, take us through this, uh, this very interesting subject. Sounds great. Thank you, Phil. And again, as always, feel free to uh, jump in if you have anything you want to, to add or any uh, things you want to let the folks know as we go through. Sure will. So today, as, as Phil mentioned, we're going to be going through um, anterior knee pain. And just like we've done in the previous uh, webinars, we're going to do that in relation to talking about the biomechanical disease uh, itself and then also relate that to uh, you know, several cases. So in this case, we have uh, Laurent Duvernay-Tardif, who is a uh, National Football League player who had residual anterior knee pain after some injuries. And again, he, we worked through to identify his specific uh, biomechanical abnormalities to change the way he moved and you know, get rid of his pain. And then we'll also talk about in the context of um, you know, some of the more classic uh, anterior knee pain, uh, middle-aged woman, 48 years old, persistent anterior knee pain, and kind of the classic presentation of somebody with that uh, anterior knee pain diagnosis. So pain during activities in which there's a lot of knee flexion extension, as well as um, a lot of forces, muscular forces that are going to be in and around the knee. So pain with stairs, pain with lunges, squats, and again that goes into the diagnosis of patellofemoral pain syndrome. So typical for this patient, um, you know, heavy focus on glute strengthening and really quadriceps strengthening. But despite this global Therex approach, still not, you know, improving the symptoms uh, that she had had. So let's talk for a couple minutes about anterior knee pain in, in kind of the clinical context and kind of what we know about it, how do patients present with it, and what are the, the biomechanical underpinnings of, of this kind of condition? Well, when we look at anterior knee pain. So I'm going to use the terms anterior knee pain and, and patellofemoral pain syndrome uh, interchangeably. That, you know, there might be some differences that people will argue between the two, but in general what we're talking about today is you know, pain in the anterior knee region um, that has been, that's coming from, uh, suspected to come from the patellofemoral articulation where other mechanical causes have been ruled out. And when we look at knee pain in, in general, I mean that's one of the primary reasons that people are going to consult with their general practitioner. And of the, those patients with knee pain, you know, anterior knee pain is one of the most common reasons that people uh, will present with knee pain at all. And particularly, uh, these patients are going to present to the general practitioners, uh, but they're also going to be seen in kind of the sports injury, orthopedic type outpatient clinics. When you look at the prevalence of patellofemoral disorders, um, you know, it really accounts for one in six knee pain consultations. So that's a, that's a really large chunk of the patients with knee pain that are seeing the general practitioners. Um, when we think about, you know, all these other things we think of as being really common, like knee arthritis or, or medial knee pain, 
um, or ACL, I, one in six being anterior knee pain or patellofemoral pain, you know, it's a large chunk of the, the, the knee patients that are out there. So something that obviously we come across on pretty much a daily or weekly basis in the clinic. The thing about patellofemoral knee pain that is, is kind of separate from a lot of the other uh, diagnoses that we have is that it's really a multifactorial and kind of nebulous pathology and there's no specific test I can do to kind of rule in or rule out patellofemoral pain syndrome. If you think about somebody with knee arthritis, I can take a you know, PA flex knee radiograph and that's what I use to make my diagnosis of knee osteoarthritis. If I think about somebody with an ACL tear, I can do special tests in the clinic and then also order something like an MRI to you know, evaluate whether or not that structure has been torn or not. In something like patellofemoral pain syndrome, and again, most of us know this, but it's really a diagnosis of exclusion. So we go and we rule out all of these other known conditions. And if none of those other known conditions come up in any of our imaging or special tests, then we're kind of left with this diagnosis of patellofemoral pain syndrome. You know, there are some diagnostic tests that can help us, things like the apprehension test or the theater movie sign. There might be some crepitus that's specifically you know, felt or uh, kind of posterior to the patella, but there's no real specific gold standard test that I can use with kind of 100% specificity and um, sensitivity. So really this is a condition that's based on symptoms of patients having pain after I've ruled everything else out. You know, the downstream consequences though are, are pretty large. You know, when somebody has this type of knee pain, they typically are gonna change their physical activity. And if this type of condition is most prevalent in that younger athletic patient population, well then that's a big impact on their quality of life. If the pain is so much that it's impeding their ability to even go up and down a flight of stairs or do a lunge or do a squat. So we have this kind of nebulous multifactorial um, disease. It's really prevalent. And then we know that the patients that have it, you know, have a pretty large, uh, has a pretty large impact on uh, their quality of life. Some of the things we do know about patellofemoral pain syndrome is that in most cases, there tends to be some factor of overload. And we can really you know, divide overload up into kind of two different uh, meanings of the word. So the first way that we might have overload is simply that the patient is doing too much, too soon, or too quickly. So this would be the example of a patient who doesn't have any necessarily biomechanical abnormalities, but they are all of a sudden going out and increasing their running load or their training load or increasing their duration. So they have overload in the sense of they simply went from doing not a lot to doing a whole lot of activity. So it's kind of this generalized overload. However, we also have the overload in the sense that, you know, patients have some abnormal positioning of the lower extremity and normal activities, normal amounts of activity are causing really specific overloads within the joint itself. So you can see here in the red, one of the thing, or in the, the yellow, you know, patellar maltracking is one thing that can really lead to a specific area of overload within the patellofemoral joint. And, you know, the patellar maltracking can come from a variety of reasons. It could be truly a structural issue where they have some abnormalities in their structure. It could be a strength imbalance where I have, you know, either strength imbalance or motor activation imbalances where the patella is being pulled medially or laterally. Or it could be coming from passive structures like the IT band or other retinacular structures that are pulling passively, increasing the tension and pulling the patella in the other direction. So really I like to think about it in kind of these two ways, overload in general or specific overload where either the patella is being maltracked and you know, increasing the stresses within the knee joint, or we could have the condition of something like a flexion contracture. So in a flexion contracture, even though the patella may not be shifted medially or laterally, the knee ends up being in a flexed position. And the more flexion I put the knee in, the more compression forces I'm going to experience between the posterior side of the patella and the anterior side of the femur. So in that sense, we still have this excessive overload condition within and around the joint. 
and it's also true that you know the the patella doesn't necessarily become abnormally positioned in isolation so it's not just necessarily what's happening at the knee but what's happening at the knee can be driven from changes at the hip or changes at the ankle or changes in the tibia that can all lead to malpositioning of the patella within that knee joint itself so you know key things to keep in mind is that really any alteration in the tibial femoral, tibial femoral kinematics is going to influence the patella alignment so again if i have rotation of the the tibia. If I have interrotation of the tibia, well, it's going to pull the patella medially. Uh, if I have a varus alignment, it's going to pull the patella medially. So these structures of the knee joint, of the tibiofemoral joint, are not separate and distinct from what's happening at the patellofemoral joint. Any change that happens at the tibiofemoral joint is going to affect the positioning of the patella relative to the anterior side of the knee. It's also true that patellofemoral pain syndrome is you know, most common in these young female athletes that don't have any structural changes, such as increased Q angle or significant chondral damage. So this, this is a condition that it's, it's kind of bigger than just you know, a, a pure, um, you have some structurally, structural alignment or some static alignment issue, and that's what's calling your, causing your patellofemoral pain. A lot of it really has to do with what's happening dynamically. So what's the position of their tibiofemoral joint when we are moving that could have a potential effect on the uh, patellofemoral joint? So moving kind of now from the, the prevalence and the, the description of the, the fact that the patellofemoral pain is related to mechanics, let's actually talk a little bit about the mechanics itself. When we look at the articulation of the patellofemoral articulation, well, we're going to have articulation primarily with the anterior side of the femur and the patella that's going to sit on, so on top of it. You know, the, the inferior portion of the femur is mostly going to be in contact with the tibia, but I can't really ignore what's happening at this joint because any changes in this joint are going to affect, again, my patella position uh, as it sits inside that trochlea. So again, the femoral trochlea is going to be the, the part of the femur in which that patella is going to track superiorly and inferiorly. If you look at the femoral trochlea, there's a part that's going to be covered in articular cartilage, which is shown here in this kind of reddish color. And then there's a part that's going to be non-articulating or not covered in articular cartilage, and that's shown in this white color. The patella is going to track between both regions of this femur, and we'll talk about the, the importance of that transition from the superior portion to this inferior portion in a minute. When I use the term trochlear rail, the trochlear rail is going to be describing this indentation of the anterior portion of the femur through which the patella should be tracking. If I have abnormalities in this trochlear rail, that can change the position of the uh, patella as it tracks superior to inferiorly. Again, if I have also changes in the tibial femoral joint, it can pull the patella out of the trochlear rail or on either edge of the trochlear rail, which can lead to uh, painful syndromes as well. So ideally, the patella should be tracking right in the middle of this along this indentation known as the trochlear rail. When we look at the regions of contact, which is really what this, this figure is showing us, you can see that at different amounts of knee flexion, I'm going to have different regions of contact between the patella and the femur. And so when I'm at zero degrees of, of knee flexion, so I'm fully extended, you can see that the patella is going to sit outside of this articular cartilage surface of the femur. <coughs> Excuse me. As I get to about 20 or 30 degrees, this is where I really start initiating contact between the articulating surface of the patella on the inferior side and the superior portion of the femur on the anterior side. So think about it going from, you know, this is a really important time of transition from where the patella is sitting outside of the femur to where it starts engaging with the trochlea. And again, that happens around 20 or 30 degrees of knee flexion. And then as I bend the knee more and more, you can see that the patella is going to track more and more inferiorly along that trochlear surface of the femur. 
So we like to think about this in, in kind of stages, you know, zero to 20 degrees. This is an important region where we go from this really unstable portion of the patella to a more stable um, connection between the articulating surfaces of the patella uh, and the kneecap. When I go from about 20 to 90 degrees, now the patella is within the trochlear groove. And then as I get past 90 degrees, this is where I'm at maximal congruence, but I'm also at you know, maximal uh, compression forces between those two structures as well. So here's just a, you know, kind of a simple uh, video showing you that change from the patella being outside of the trochlea in full extension to kind of coming and articulating inside the deeper portion of the trochlear groove as we go into more and more knee flexion. So key takeaways here are in the beginning portion of the gait cycle, two things are happening. One, the knee is almost fully extended, which means the patella is going to be the least stable. And then from about zero to 20 degrees of knee flexion, where I start loading the knee during my loading response phase of the gait cycle, this is that important time of transition from going outside of the femoral uh, trochlea to really within that femoral trochlea. So I need to make sure that things are properly aligned, particularly within that first uh, 20 to 30 degrees of knee flexion. So again, this is now just a visual of that, what does that gait cycle look like in terms of knee flexion? So this is our knee flexion graph. The higher values on the left side on the, um, the y-axis indi indicate knee flexion. So zero degrees is full knee extension, 80 degrees of knee flexion here. And again, this is our gait cycle on the bottom. So the, the yellow circles are indicating those points in time where I'm really going through that transitional phase from either going from an extended knee into a flex knee or going from a flex knee into an extended knee. So these are the time periods that we talk about as being the catching mechanism of the patellofemoral joint. The point in time from where I'm going from the really unstable, unconnected patella to a patella that's being pulled into the trochlear groove or going from the trochlear groove out. So the, the catching mechanism happens in several regions of the gait cycle. During loading response, during the latter or mid portions of stance as I'm coming from a flex position to an extended position, as I'm preparing for swing in that push off phase, I go from an extended knee into a flex knee. And then again, as I prepare for initial contact. So kind of four portions throughout the gait cycle where I'm gonna be going through this catching mechanism. Now, you know, think about how many steps we take on a daily basis. If we think about, we're taking thousands and thousands of steps, the catching mechanism much worse, must work properly, you know, four times however many thousand steps we, we take per day. So we're taking 10,000 steps per day. Well, then this has to happen 40,000 times uh, in a smooth fashion. If it's not happening in a smooth fashion and I'm getting some shifting or some knocking that's occurring during that catching mechanism, well, think about how that might lead to patellofemoral pain syndrome. Now I'm doing this slight increased stress of the patellofemoral joint, but I'm doing it you know, 40,000 times per day. So even really small changes in the pathway of the patellofemoral joint multiplied by the number of steps we take per day can really lead to uh, a, a painful syndrome for many individuals. And if I may, just to share my own experience, when I, I, I was treating, uh, you know, uh, anterior knee pain and I learned about this catching mechanism occurring four times at each and every step, it really opened my mind because I don't know for, for you, Joe, and any other attendee today, but I was always trying mo more to focus on gross movement where, for example, step downs stepping down the stairs where you see really the collapse but uh seeing this made me realize that like you said we go down and up the stairs maybe four or five stairs a, a per day and it's going to be once or twice a day so even though it might be it might highlight the pain it it's not usually the core of the, the syndrome itself and when I, I learned that it really changed my my point of view and how i, I was trying to focus on the, the more um causes of the of my patient syndrome exactly and and so you know as you said too the other thing to keep in mind is not every single uh, patient with anterior knee pain is going to be um, a runner or is going to be the athlete so i think you know we're very focused on thinking about anterior knee pain and thinking about doing those tests like the, the single leg step down test or the, uh, the the single leg squatting tests but 
you know, some of these other factors like simply walking so many steps per day need to be included in the way that we evaluate these patients. Um, so in addition to just the mechanics like we were talking about in the previous slide, you know, there's the other thing that's happening during these, these time points where I'm having this uh, catching mechanism occur is that this is also a time period where I have my quadriceps engaged. And if I think about what the quadriceps do to the patellofemoral joint, well, they're gonna be pulling the patella kind of posteriorly into the femoral joint. So in addition to maybe some slight abnormalities in the positioning at both the loading response phase, as well as kind of the, the phase right before uh, swing, so kind of that push off phase, you know, I'm getting quadriceps force that's being added into this equation. So I think it's just really important that slight modifications in kinematics combined with the, the stresses experienced by the patellofemoral joint from the abnormalities and mechanics, in addition to the, the stresses that are added by the muscles, kind of really add to the, the cumulative effect of increasing compressive and shear forces in this region. So, you know, what are the, the kind of the predominant biomechanical markers or abnormalities that we see that are linked with either patellofemoral pain syndrome progression or development? Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. We just have a question. Yeah. Uh, would prolonged standing impact similarly? Like prolonged, like so many steps that we make, uh, would be prolonged standing in a wrong position impact similarly? Yeah, so it could, and, and there are some patients that talk about anterior knee pain. One of the times that they have that pain is when they're in a prolonged uh, position, whether that's sitting or whether that's standing. Uh, a lot of times these patients will complain not so much about prolonged standing, but uh, kind of prolonged sitting. Again, if I think about sitting and I'm at 90 to 120 degrees of knee flexion, the patella is really being pulled posteriorly into that uh, femoral joint, uh, which can just without even activating our muscles, have a, a fairly large amount of compression force between those two structures. With prolonged standing, uh, I can certainly also see the, the fact that that's kind of where the, the patella is the least stable. Uh, that may also lead to the, the patient having issues. Um, but prolonged positioning uh, you know, can lead to the same sort of problems that we see here. Thank you. Yep. So, you know, thinking about now the, you know, mechanical factors that are linked, you know, one of the things is going to be in that sagittal plane. So as we mentioned before, you know, somebody who's in a uh, position where they don't come into full knee um, extension, especially full knee extension or close to full knee extension during initial contact, if I'm constantly in this flex knee position, um, what can end up happening is my patella is going to be in experiencing much more compressive forces against the femur. This is the result of two things. One is simply by the more I bend my knee, the more passive force that I have between the patella and the femur because all the ligaments around it and the tendons around it are getting taut. But also being in a flex knee position is gonna cause me to activate my quadriceps greater, to a greater amount. And if I'm activating my quadriceps, they're just adding additional active force into that compression as well. So you know, somebody that has knee pain and doesn't like to keep their knee in a fully extended position or somebody who feels really unstable in a fully extended position may adopt this movement strategy of walking with a flexed knee. And while that may overcome the instability and some of the pain, immediate pain that they have, uh, it can have negative long-term consequences because I'm, again, compressing that knee to a greater extent than it should be. And then also the opposite. And if I may also go into an exaggerated extension position to avoid using my quadriceps, let's say. Well, that might avoid the stresses of the quadricep muscle activation. It's going to, again, place that patella in a malaligned position that can lead to um, worsening of that anterior knee pain. So again, here are just two kind of simple cartoons that kind of show uh, the typical abnormal positions that can really place the uh, patellofemoral joint as well as the tibial femoral joint uh, in an abnormal position and lead to an increased amount of knee pain. So these are great things to kind of show your patient to say, you know, this is how you should be landing uh, when your foot first hits the ground. But instead, you know, you're landing with uh, too much bending of the knee. In the frontal plane, 
uh, one of the things that we see commonly associated with anterior knee pain and kind of patellar maltracking is being in an exceptionally valgus or varus position. So again, valgus and varus tend to be positions of the knee we talk about as it relates to the tibiofemoral joint. However, this is gonna have a, a substantial consequence on the position of the patella if I have a change in the position of the tibiofemoral joint. So for example, in somebody who's in an exceptionally valgus position, well, it's gonna cause that patella to track laterally. Somebody who's in a, an exceptionally varus position, it's gonna cause the patella to track medially. So again, really, the, the tibiofemoral joint is, is really intimately linked to the position of the uh, patellofemoral joint in the frontal plane. So again, just other kind of videos, I think that are, are great uh, representations to show your patient of saying, look, this is what's happening uh, that can lead to the pain that you're experiencing within the knee. So either kind of that, that cowboy bow-legged position um, or kind of that, that knock knee position. If we're talking about varus, or varus, uh, valgus positioning. In addition to just kind of being positioned statically in that varus or valgus position, the other thing we see that happens a lot is somebody has a varus or valgus thrust. So if you're here for some of our OA lectures, we talked a lot about you know, the varus thrust or the valgus thrust. The varus and valgus thrust occur during the loading portion of the gait cycle, where instead of somebody kind of flexing their knee in a normal pattern, that force as we transition to single leg stance is absorbed not in the sagittal plane by knee flexion, but rather in the frontal plane by going into quickly into a varus or valgus position. So this thrust is usually a change of about three or more degrees into a quick varus or valgus position, uh, which is obviously not the way we wanna be absorbing forces at the knee. The, the issue with having a varus thrust in terms of patellofemoral syndrome is, you know, this is, the, this varus and valgus thrust occur as we're going through that zero to 20 degrees of knee flexion. So when that catching mechanism is occurring, that really critical portion of a time where the, the patella has to track um, normally into the femur, if I'm going into a varus or valgus position at that time point, it's gonna throw the patella into either the medial or lateral side of the femoral uh, trochlea, and again, can lead to increased stress and increased knee pain in the patellofemoral joint. So again, just another demonstration, valgus thrust, I land, I'm in a neutral position, then all of a sudden I go into a quick valgus positioning. Again, that's gonna have a dramatic effect on what's happening at the patellofemoral joint. And then the opposite for varus. In varus, I land in this neutral position, and then I go quickly into a um, varus position as I absorb the forces as I transition to single leg stance. And then we can't ignore also what's happening in the transverse plane. I think this is the most difficult plane to really visualize uh, changes at the tibial femoral joint because it's so hard to see when I'm looking visually or even looking at a video when things are being rotated uh, at, the, at the lower leg here. But external tibial rotation, external internal tibial rotation are common things that we see in patients with, with knee disorders. And sometimes this may be the result of an injury. So maybe they had you know, a history of ACL uh, injury, and they have some laxity, and so they go into excessive internal tibial rotation because they can't resist those forces passively. Or maybe they feel some instability, so they kind of maintain a position of external tibial rotation when they're doing all of their movements. But either way, um, this is going to lead to changes in the position of the tibial femoral joint, which is going to lead to subsequent changes in positions of the patellofemoral joint. If I have excessive external tibial rotation, well, I'm gonna also be pulling the patella laterally. And if I go into excessive internal tibial rotation, well, then maybe I'm pulling the patella medially. And again, just other examples, I think that you know, characterize clearly uh, kind of what's happening at the transverse plane and how that can lead to changes at the patellofemoral joint. So let's talk about kind of a, a case-based approach to uh, anterior knee pain and then identifying some of the biomechanical underpinnings that we could potentially modify and change to kind of improve these patients' syndromes. So today we'll talk a little bit about the case of uh, Laurent Duvarnay-Tardif, who, as I mentioned before, is a uh, professional National Football League player. Uh, he had a, a, kind of a complicated uh, kind of injury history. 
So in 2017, he had an MCL tear that happened while he was playing on the field. And so he had this MCL strain, he got rehabbed for it, uh, was feeling better. And then in a couple of weeks of physical therapy, kind of was able to get back out and, and play in the game. And even though he was able to get back out and play, uh, he still wasn't playing at kind of his full potential, really kind of didn't feel back to being 100%. You know, the quote that he says was, he, he wasn't back to 100%, but he also continued to have kind of this knee pain. And so his knee pain was persistent uh, and kind of led to this condition in which uh, he ended up having a secondary or subsequent injury uh, that was a little bit more severe than that initial MCL tear. So in this case, again, he was tackled on the field now he ended up with a fibular fracture that involved not only the, the bone itself, but also some of the, the ankle ligaments. So now he's out of the game again. Uh, he is out for 16 weeks. He has surgery. He goes through you know, rigorous rehab. He was cleared to return back to the game. And even though he was cleared from kind of a medical and rehab standpoint, he still wasn't uh, back to his normal self. You know, he still felt like he had some abnormal movement patterns. He still felt like he had um, some symptoms that were never resolved. In particular, he still had residual knee pain that kind of never went away after that uh, secondary injury. I should point out that, you know, not only is he a, um, a guard for the Kansas City Chiefs, but he is also a, a medical doctor. So maybe he's a little bit more in tune with what's going on in his body and sought out some additional care, whereas maybe some of the other athletes might not be so in tune. And they say, well, I was cleared to return back to sports, you know, I'm just going to go back and return to playing because that's what my uh, doctors and physios said I was able to do. So he learned about the, the knee KG uh, and came in for a, 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 you know, an assessment. And when you look at his musculoskeletal assessment, he was diagnosed with anterior knee pain uh, or patellofemoral pain syndrome. And, you know, he was put through the typical musculoskeletal assessment you would do for this type of patient. This is a big guy, strong guy, you know, professional NFL athlete, when you did the strength testing, there was no noticeable strength deficits or asymmetries uh, or deficiencies. He was, he was really strong. There was no muscle stiffness. And when we did the tests that we typically do in the clinic, like a squat or the one-legged squat or the step-down test, he had good control over those activities. So the typical things we think about as being prominent in somebody that has this anterior knee pain, he didn't present with in his musculoskeletal examination. No strength deficits, no muscle stiffness, and good control during some of the more challenging tasks. He did have some residual ankle stiffness and dorsiflexion from his injury, and he had some excessive overpronation, which again was also linked with his uh, ankle injury. So kind of given this musculoskeletal assessment, he was doing a treatment plan that consisted of you know, explosive quadriceps strengthening, so high-level quad strengthening, uh, glute strengthening, and then wore orthotics to help manage uh, some of the, the abnormalities that were noted at the ankle. So I'm going to play for you the video of his gait. And again, I think Phil will share a poll with us to see if we can identify in the way that he is moving any gross abnormalities that might change our treatment, appro uh, treatment approach for this patient. So take a minute, I'm going to leave these videos running for a couple minutes to kind of take a look from both the frontal plane as well as the sagittal plane and, um, you know, enter your, your votes here in terms of what you are able to see in terms of his uh, biomechanical abnormalities. And uh, as, uh, as we uh, take the pool, uh, there's a question about tibial internal rotation. Does the patella go medial or lateral? So typically we would say it goes medial, right? It's going to be pulled medial. So especially if it's going to be combined with uh, a varus alignment, for example, varus with internal tibial rotation will pull or misalign the patella medially, but it's not always as clear, right? If, for example, you have a, a valgus alignment with an internal tibial rotation, then it might lead more to tilting of the patella or changing the, 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 the angle of the patella itself. So it's not always systematic, but generally speaking, internal rotation would lead to medial pulling of the patella. Thanks for the question. And 
also on the poll, you'll see that there's two questions, right? The first question and the second one. So if you want to take time to consider both. Yeah, I know there's some, some issues with freezing still. You know, we tried to change our internet connections, but I think with having these large Zoom meetings, uh, sometimes the video quality is, is suboptimal. So given what you can see, um, you know, feel free to jump in and vote for what you both see and then what you might do to um, you know, improve this patient's care. On my side, it's, it's pretty fluid. So, uh, and you're showing the screen, so uh, it, it means that at least your connection is pretty good. So okay. we, you've done your part. <laughs> We, so we have another question uh, while people vote. With regards of overpronation, was likely taped into that position for playing to avoid inversion or push up lateral? Okay, so it's more a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the primary approach was to use um, an orthotic to stop overpronation. And we had the opportunity to test him with and without the orthotic to see if the orthotic really did uh, stabilize uh, the knee joint and uh, the, that stopping this overpronation would have an impact or not on the knee joint. So we could see if their, their, their use of their orthotic was justified in terms of correcting the knee pain itself. So I'm gonna get your last votes in and then we will uh, discuss what we saw. Excellent. So I'll end the polling. Oh, last minute votes. Okay. So if we share the results, uh, we reach a majority for external tibial rotation um, at heel strike, most likely. So most of us does see that. Uh, for the other, it's kind of a split in between, is it a varus alignment or is it a varus thrust movement on a neutral alignment? 25% more go for a varus thrust, only 15% might see a varus. It is split as we see in, in between valgus or varus, kind of the same vote amount. Internal rotation is not a majority. 80% uh, of people do not think that the patient does has an internal tibial rotation. So we really stick to external tibial rotation. And we do have a strong, uh, a lot of votes for dynamic flexion contraction so that the, the patient would keep the knee banded all the way through or at least at the heel stretch. Uh, and then and what we would do, quadriceps strengthening in the last year of six and really his major, hits the majority, where the second would be gait retraining from various correction at 35, 36% only. So the majority would not, but still some would. And then we go back to glute strengthening and activation that really has a high level of votes. And tibial strengthening have some votes and then foot orthotic. And again, I think it's really interesting to be able to have the sensor with testing and retesting with and without foot orthotics. So very interesting. We'll see uh, what are the results before discussing it. Right. Oh, oh, it has. So if we look at the, the results actually from the knee KG, I think what was interesting is that you know, two main things kind of came out in terms of what were his actual biomechanical abnormalities that may be known to contribute to anterior knee pain. And the two things that we saw were a, a delayed knee flexion combined with internal tibial rotation and a dynamic varus alignment, again, combined with that internal tibial rotation. Um, so kind of, you can see the explanation here, but kind of the for the, for the first biomechanical marker, we really are looking at the timing and efficiency of muscle recruitment was not really functional because he had that kind of delayed knee flexion and excessive internal tibial rotation, which we uh, kind of assume to be a condition that 
the muscles are not stabilizing that knee in the transverse plane. So we, always, we tend to think about the, the excessive internal motion as being kind of a lack of uh, muscle control. In terms of the dynamic varus alignment, again, we mentioned before in this webinar how if I have varus alignment, well, I'm gonna be pulling the, the patella medially. And then combined with that interruptive rotation, again, I can be pulling that patella even more medially. So here is a condition in which I'm concerned about that patella to actually being uh, compressed on the, the medial side of the knee joint. So two potential biomechanical markers that we might want to address uh, using specific rehab interventions that might include motor control, strengthening, and retraining techniques. So that kind of change. So we, we do have a, a little question about the yeah. results, yeah. about um, the delayed knee flexion. So what it means is that the patient uh, did have a good flexion. So he did heel strike okay, and then bend his knee to absorb the impact, so this is good. So no flexion contracture. I was was noted, but it was uh, not optimal in the way that rather than doing a fluid flexion like we all do, he uh, he stopped twice in in the process of flexion. So really something that we could not pick it up, but it, the movement was stopped twice, meaning that the hamstring was engaging during this absorption. Uh, so it was delayed in that way. So suboptimal, especially for somebody somebody that has to absorb so much loads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think when we think about motion, a lot of times, we, you know, we are uh, focused on looking at the, like the magnitude uh, or the, the numbers. But one of the other pieces when we look at a biomechanical assessment is not just how much are they doing, but what is the, the timing of that? You know, is it occurring in a smooth manner or is it delayed or does it happen early? So this what's made, I think this is what makes, you know, a visual assessment so challenging. It's that we're not just looking solely at the magnitude of how much or how little they're moving, but also what's the timing? Are they doing it in the kind of correct uh, portion of the, the, the gait cycle where I would expect this type of motion to happen? And so again, it's, it's hard to kind of both focus on magnitude as well as timing for something that happens in less than a second. So, you know, this kind of led to um, a modified treatment program for him. So in addition to the kind of uh, explosive strengthening uh, exercises he was doing, you know, we wanted to add into this an element of control. And in particular, we wanted to focus on normalizing the knee flexion as well as the internal tibia rotation. So from a, a retraining perspective, what would that look like? Well, that would look like maintaining a neutrally aligned uh, lower leg while doing a knee flexion and extension activity. So doing something like a lunge while maintaining a really neutrally aligned uh, uh, lower leg would be one key to that. So that'd be kind of the, the retraining or the alignment control piece. The other thing we want to do is think about what are the stabilizers of that lower leg? Well, one of the stabilizers of the lower leg is going to be my anterior tibialis. You know, that plays a really important role in controlling the foot as it lowers down to the ground. If I kind of have, you know, an uncontrolled lowering, I tend to have a collapse of this lower leg kinetic chain. So we also focused on, you know, doing dorsiflexion strengthening and dorsiflexion retraining to help improve the, the activity of that muscle to control the foot and prevent that excessive kind of internal tibial uh, rotation collapse that we see in somebody who doesn't necessarily have that stability of the lower leg. And the other thing that, you know, we focused on was removing that dynamic varus alignment. So, you know, here's somebody who has maybe a neutrally aligned knee, so a knee that's, you know, in good neutral alignment, but when they start bearing weight on that leg, you know, it shifts into kind of a functional dynamic varus position. So how do I correct that? Well, one of the things that I can do is I can exaggerate that person's um, uh, abnormality. So in this case, in the bottom, you can see, you can take a strap, an elastic strap, tie it around the femur, and it's gonna provide uh, tension or force in this lateral direction. That's gonna pull the knee into more varus. So when the knee is pulled into more varus, the physio is gonna provide cues for them to keep a neutrally aligned knee. So they're essentially learning to overcome that uh, varus type of alignment um, while they're doing some dynamic activities. 
So you could do it during kind of this push off phase that's shown here, or you could do it in a situation that's gonna recreate something like the loading response. So doing it like a single leg squat or something like that. In either case, again, you're focused on maintaining a neutrally aligned knee while you're performing some strengthening or dynamic activity. Phil, do you have anything else uh, about this here, about the treatments? Yeah, it was just interesting when we discussed these results with uh, his physical therapy team uh, that was following him, uh, how they, they, they saw the opportunity to shift from, you know, they were focused on sports and performance, which is uh, ideal for him, but more into a uh, power right pushing and that's what he needs obviously but showing these results uh, highlighted that the fact that he's also absorbing and controlling the, coll the collapse of the, the tibia like you said so more eccentric control of the anterior tibialis the quads and stuff like this so uh, even th that might have been a little bit overlooked but having this kind of information led to the shift and that was uh, the key for uh, the finishing and optimizing his rehab. So obviously everything that was done before was great, but having this last new information had led to understanding why there was some residual pain. So it was a very interesting discussion. With the team. Mm -hmm. So kind of just the outcome, you know, um, the, these modified treatments were integrated into his plan of care and into his training. And, you know, not even uh, months and months and years later, but rather a month later, you know, he felt like he was so much better and it, he felt that it was 100% effective and really eliminated uh, the knee pain that he had been experiencing ever since that uh, initial injury a couple years prior. Uh, he had an interview with the press, you know, four months after this and said, you know, he feels that he has returned to the best level of fitness and performance uh, that he's ever experienced in, in his career. So, again, I think it speaks to the fact that we can make these small changes. And, you know, there wasn't anything in terms of his rehab um, that was unknown to us. We, you know, nothing was done that was out of the ordinary, but more about focusing on changing these slight biomechanical abnormalities that really led to a change in the knee pain that he was experiencing and, and truly a more normalization of the gait that, um, you know, was obviously not normal. So again, the uh, patellofemoral knee pain uh, is maybe not Maybe one last a, thing that we... Yeah. Uh, last, maybe one thing somebody would ask uh, about the orthotics. Mm -hmm. So we, did, we show that, like you said, that the, the patient was going into a varus dynamically and the orthotic led to an increase of this varus uh, alignment, mm -hmm. but failed to correct this internal to rotation movement. So what leads to the patient say, well, I'm, I'm wearing these orthotic mainly for my knee issue, even though I do have an overpronation, but it was mainly for my knee issue, but it failed to correct and instead it increased the issue. So for that patient, he decided to not wear his orthotic anymore. And so uh, that was a, a big uh, answer to of, uh, of this assessment with and without the orthotic. Yeah, again, I think we talked about this last week, but this is, uh, again, the benefit of doing an objective motion analysis is you give somebody an orthotic to correct something at the ankle, but you can actually then see what effect is that happening, you know, what effect is that having at the knee. So uh, while you might think that you are resolving one issue, uh, you might be creating another issue somewhere else. And so uh, even though he had some, uh, you know, maybe some overpronation, some limitations in movement, his pain was at the knee. And so the, the intention was if I normalize the ankle, I'm going to correct what's happening at the knee. And that wasn't necessarily the case. The, you know, the orthotic may have been correcting something at the ankle, but it wasn't resolving you know, the more symptomatic issue, which was the, the pain that was at the knee. And so by using an objective uh, tool like the knee KG, you could actually say, what am I actually doing with this orthotic at the knee? Am I actually improving the patient's mechanics? Uh, or am I potentially making it worse or not changing it at all? And so I think, you know, in a, in a condition like anterior knee pain or patellofemoral pain syndrome, there's not one biomechanical pathway that's going to lead 
the patient to have this knee pain. It could be excessive internal rotation. It could be uh, excessive knee flexion. It could be a position of varus or valgus. And so if I have a one size fits all intervention, which is I'm gonna do strengthening exercises in and around the knee, that's not gonna address the potential underlying mechanisms that are leading this patient to have that pain at the knee in the first place. So, you know, anterior knee pain in general, we think about it a condition that's linked with overload, either activity overload or mechanical overload. Um, and there's a whole bunch of potential biomechanical alterations or abnormalities that can lead to somebody having this condition. And particularly we see that, you know, the, the catching mechanism that what's happening in that zero to 20 degrees of knee flexion is a really important time that the kinematics have to be normal and appropriate to prevent this anterior knee pain from getting worse. So at this time, Phil, if you have anything else, otherwise we can take some, uh, some questions. Yes, so we have a question about uh, placement of the strap band on the femur or the tibia. Would it make a big difference in dynamic varus training? So if you allow me, I'll just share my screen really quickly to show you the exercise program that we'll share with uh, Laurent. So like you mentioned about absorption, these were the exercises. And in terms of varus correction, then you, you had these uh, elastic bands to, to pull it out. Typically we put it to the tight so we can feel it uh, and it's more comfortable rather than on the tibia. But obviously depending on the situation, you could put it on the tibia too. And um, so I, I know the time is almost over, but for him, we also had stretching the glutes because the glutes in this case could lead to uh, external femoral rotation or various alignment. And uh, this, this was uh, again for dorsiflexion, you mentioned it. So this was a program. And I must say that at the at first sight, as a football player used to be doing big uh, training, he was uh, kind of surprised of doing some easy exercise like this. But uh, like you mentioned, uh, he did uh, engage into his exercise and after one month, it made a big difference. So even slight uh, easy exercise, but in terms of focusing on control can make a big difference for our anterior knee patient again because of the catching mechanism being so important to be precise and, uh, and people that are going to be a lot of repetition in their movement. So we do have a lot of questions. Uh, we'll try to answer them quickly. So uh, I, I don't fully understand the reason you give a dorsiflexion exercise. This is because this patient had a, a past injury, right? And he failed to have a, to regain dorsiflexion. But more specifically, we're talking about eccentric control of the anterior tibialis. And this has been shown to be linked with the collapse of internal tibial rotation during absorption. So what happens during absorption is that the, you have your foot drop where your, your heels strike the ground and then the, the, the foot is going to drop, right? So if you want to control this foot drop, you have good you have to have good eccentric dorsiflexion control. And this, if you fail to do this, it can lead to collapsing of the whole tibia into internal rotation. All right. And uh, did the active visibly change his gait biomechanic? Yes, but we do not have the video right now available. Um, well, visibly. Not visibly, but on the on the, the Nikki G, we can pick it up. But like we saw, I think, was it in the first webinar on the OA when we compare? Oh, no, it's, it's on the next webinar, sorry. We are going to compare an athlete before and after. And when you try to visibly see these changes, typically because it's not gross changes, like a big collapse at, at step down, it's really tough to visibly assess the changes. But with these did see changes in the biomechanic with the assessment. And we have a, a question on the chat, um, Joe. I don't want to, uh, I think people are going to start uh, putting out. So thank you very much for your for your time. If you want to stay in five minutes, we'll, we'll try to answer your question. But looking forward uh, next week webinar uh, about, 
um, TKA post post uh, post surgical pain and how to optimize rehab even for a patient that do not have pain after surgery. So thank you very much. I do the F still five minutes. Yep, I do. So you have a question in the chat about from uh, Lena. Would you like to maybe read it and answer it? Yeah, so there's a uh, question about, um, let's see, the placement of the strap. Is that what you're talking about? No, not more in the chat. You have when uh, retraining tibial internal rotation, the various stress should be placed both above on the femur and below on the tibia. Oh, Is okay. one more effective than the other in retraining, re regaining control of tibial rotation? I'm assuming both would be optimal. Yeah, so I, I would think that both of them would be optimal. So I think that um, the the exercise that we showed uh, with the the band pulling laterally was more about the um, uh, addressing the varus issue. So the the varus issue, if you if you can imagine whether I put the band on the thigh or whether I put it on the tibia, if I pull straight laterally, it's going to increase the amount of varus that patient's experiencing. So that exercise is really more for uh, addressing the varus. To address the rotational issue, that's where we would work on strengthening and improving the control of the anterior tibialis, as well as giving cues to kind of keep the, the knee cap from turning in while they're performing like the, the stepping activity and things like that. Right, I agree totally. And we have another question about if he would have the opposite uh, instead of having internal rotation, if he would have external rotation, what would have we recommend as a exercises? And the particularity of this external rotation, it does not occur typically on the weight bearing. So internal rotation occur because you put your weight on your foot and then you fail to to stabilize it, and then there's a collapse internally. It can happen for different reasons. But external to rotation does not come from weight bearing. Typically, it comes from pushing or swing technique. So it completely differ. We typically want to retrain the good push up, retrain the good swing and heel strike technique. So it, it might involve um, uh, muscle use for the push up. It might involve correcting a, a valgus collapse during push-up that you need to correct prior to changing the, the external rotation. Or it might in also involve um, stretching because some muscle like the IT band or the uh, bicep femoris might, might be tight and might pull the, the, the tibia into inter external rotation during the swing. So completely a different approach. I hope that answered your question. Maybe one last question before we go. Uh, when you are retraining the eccentric tibia tib ad, what other structures or muscle would will be implicated in the same exercise? I mean, you're going to have all the dorsiflexors kind of uh, active during that portion. Um, so, you know, the EHL, even though we think about that as a uh, muscle to control the toes and the extension of the digitorum to, to control the toes, they also play a role in controlling the foot as it's lowered down to the ground. Uh, so those will also be involved in um, that exercise. Uh, but primarily, we're, we're trying to, you know, capture the dorsiflexor muscle group to really control the foot as it lowers to the ground so we don't end up with a really fast kind of collapse of the foot and then collapse of the, the lower kinetic chain as well. The exercise that we showed, uh, the question is, are you, know, are you asking for activation or positioning of the hips in the lumbopelvic area? Uh, in the, the, the case that we showed, you'd wanna have the, uh, the hip muscles, lumbopelvic core muscles stabilized because those are also important stabilizers of the, uh, the mid uh, region. But that exercise was really focused on uh, the foot control rather than, you know, core control. But it wouldn't obviously hurt to have them focus on their core control while they're doing that. You don't want to have 
you don't have core control, you're not going to have control really anywhere. So um, you know, that yeah. should be involved in that type of exercise as well. The good thing with that patient is that he was followed by a really great team, right, already. So he had this great core control already. So that was not part of the, of the treatment plan for him because he was stable. And he was able to engage full into that. But if we would have time, maybe another time, with if you're interested to go deeper into into knee pain, we could discuss different cases where we have to adjust with poor control at times. Thank you very much. Um, oh, we have a last comment. I would suggest that you should cue these muscle with every opportunity because I think worse in isolation. That's so true. That's the whole concept, right? We're talking about specific gait, uh, ex uh, specific strengthening exercise, but of course, like you see, the core message is always gait retraining or movement retraining into function. That's the way we think too. Thank you very much uh, for your comment, Lisa. Offered. So thank you for all of your questions, your interaction. We see that we had a really uh, professionals on the on the on the webinar today again. It's really enjoyable to have you on board with us. And obviously, we have big amount of webinar uh, of, of attendees, so it's difficult to have you all interact. But again, we, we would be pleased to have one on one discussion with with you if you want to go deeper, or if you want to uh, discuss. So again, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, I'll put my email on there. Uh, but anyway, we're looking forward to seeing you next week. And thank you very much, uh, Joe, as usual. Very good job. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.